Welcome to the RJLT Economics. Today I want to discuss a very interesting topic, something that I've uh, long wanted to talk about, uh, to touch on, which is understanding new conservatism. I specifically in this, uh, in today's podcast, want to discuss um, the hubris and belief systems of uh, new conservatives versus realism, a uh, real politics type of uh, take on geopolitics. I want to say that the new conservatives in general um, tend to market themselves uh, with a system of values and beliefs, but they also believe themselves to be re a real politic type of people. They see the world in terms of games, uh, perhaps zero-sum games, but not necessarily, but they see them in terms of games. Uh, by the same time, I want to argue that these new conservatives have a level of hubris that they do not seem to fully grasp. In other words, they think they are being realistic while uh, their real, real, real politic type of approach to geopolitics can be quite egoistic. And today's, I, I, I wanted to do it today because I just listened to a couple of uh, um, interviews um, featuring Professor John Mearsheimer uh, from University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Mearsheimer is uh, a typical think tank type uh, new conservative who loves to talk, to talk about values, uh, but at the same time, when you simply go a little bit beneath the surface, then the person becomes very uh, realistic, at least appear to be very realistic. The, uh, Professor Mischheimer's takes on geopolitics is purely uh, in uh, the approach of uh, winners and losers and purely in terms of zero-sum games, this professor in particular. Uh, by the same time, I must say that the, the real reason that I wanted to make this uh, podcast today is because in his attempts to address geopolitics uh, from a somewhat realistic approach, it appears to me that he has a level of hubris that is exemplary of uh, believers of American exceptionalism. And this I believe is the fundamental difference between other nationalists and other uh, and other um, politicians from major or, or leaders, let's say, from uh, major powers, and the new conservatives in the Western liberal democracies. So first things first. Let's let me just uh, uh, go just a little bit deeper into this dichotomy between beliefs and hubris and realism. New conservatives want to talk about values and their values are invariably freedom and democracy. Now I love these ideas. I, I think very few people uh, very few free-thinking people, at least, can, can, can argue against the idea of freedom. I really think, personally, I think freedom is the most essential element in the, in the, in the idea of human rights. Right? This is a, this Voltairean idea of human rights. This I think it's the most essential element, and I think it has a universal appeal. 
across civilizations. Now, the, the idea of democracy is something that is more uh, debatable because democracy, in my judgment, is a process to build democratic, uh, to, to build, um, democratic institutions, to, um, to involve the populace in the decision-making that affect their lives. This is a process. It is not a, a value that's, that is black and white, uh, that is um, something that, um, that, that can easily be distinguished. And of course, when the new conservatives talk about democracy, however, they are talking about American democracy. That means that there will be elections and there and from that elections there will be um, there will be representatives and these representatives will then work for the interests of the major corporations per, and every two years for the Congress six years for the for the Senate and four years to for the uh, for the presidency uh, as well as the um, the governor uh, the governors, um, you will have uh, again go to your constituents uh, uh, and uh, uh, ask for their votes. But afterwards, you don't do much, and that's this is basically American style democracy. So you uh, have the the votes from the population, but actually serve the interests of the corporations. This is American style democracy, and this really is what the uh, the new conservatives are talking about. However, when it comes to what they really think, they don't really care. It's so blatantly obvious that they don't really care. Uh, they don't care about whether their allies are free or not, whether they are democratic or not, insofar as it achieves their geopolitical goals. And their ge geopolitical goals is also very simple. It is not to promote freedom and democracy. In fact, um, they have a long history of subverting um, foreign countries when uh, sub -sub subverting foreign democratically elected governments in favor of regimes that uh, would support their foreign policies. And this is most obvious um, in Latin America, where I doubt, I'm not, I, I don't want, don't take me word don't don't take my word fully for it. I think there may be some exceptions, but I can't think of an exception of a single country in Latin America that has not had a regime change operation by the by by, by the CIA in the last seventy years. And of course, uh, it's also happened across the globe in various different, uh, in, in Africa, in Europe, and uh, in Asia. So they are really realistic, they're really realistic about um, their nation building efforts. When they build democracies, they build democracies, uh, th when they talk about, they wanting to build countries, nation building, to build democracies. Really, they are building, um, they are building countries that will serve their interests. But what I want to argue, I, I think that the the above points are beyond, uh, how to say, uh, it, to me, it's beyond doubt. I, I think very few people will have problems with this dichotomy. But my argument 
the argument that I want to make in this podcast is that the new conservatives, even though they think they are wholly realistic, that they want to pursue a, a uh, foreign policy that serves the interests of their empire, in reality, this, there is a level of hubris, a level of uh, ignorance in the real world that, that entails that um, their so-called realistic approaches are not always so realistic after all. And what I mean by this is that in my judgment, and as I have touched on in my previous podcast, I believe that a lot of the new conservatives hold the uh, um, share the belief of uh, uh, basically something akin to this this idea of manifest destiny. In other words that America is chosen by God to lead the world. They may not believe this in a, uh, in, in explicitly. They may not believe this consciously. Um, but I think subconsciously they hold this belief. And I think this is really analogous to a lot of the uh, jihadi terrorists who happen to be alcohol drinking pimps and uh, drug dealers, uh, small criminals before they they come they they committed to uh, their cause of jihadi terrorism, right? Um, so in other words, they are not real practice. Uh, the new conservatives don't, are not real grow, good Christians. They don't really believe in God, but they subconsciously believe that they are the chosen one and that their power, the, the reason, their reason being is determined, is gifted to them by God. And with this belief, a lot of actions can be justified. So this, I think, is my general argument. Now let's just go into uh, this a uh, couple of podcasts that I listened. Um, Professor John uh, uh, Mearsheimer and uh, this professor is very interesting. I really liked uh, his attempts at honesty. So here I want to point out some points. Of course I agree with him at some levels. He is not spilling nonsense uh, like some of the uh, um, commentators that I have heard. He is speaking kind of reason, but with this reason, it specific with his reasoning, specifically reviews, um, specifically supports my argument. So let me give you some examples. On the one hand, he wants, he talked a bit about the idea that, you know, America needs to defend uh, the democracy and freedom of, in this interview specifically of Australia, uh, against, of course, Chinese ag aggression. By the same time, he is unashamed in saying that the interests of the Europeans are not so uh, are not really of concern, um, because. The Europeans don't perceive uh, the, the Chinese as a major threat and it is very difficult to, to persuade them uh, as such and because the Europeans have a somewhat visceral reaction to the Russians and because uh, Professor Mischheimer confesses uh, that uh, they ultimately would love to pull Russia into their camp so as to contain China. As a result, I, they think uh, he, he suggests that the interests 
and thereby the, the freedom and democracy of the Europeans are, dis are dispensable. Um, so basically, essentially what he is saying is that to protect the freedom and democracy of Australians from Chinese aggression, they should uh, give up the Europeans and l perhaps concede European freedom and democracy to uh, the Russians. This is, of course, not very surprising. He is making, an, uh, making a point that, in his judgment, the containment of China is currently the, pr uh, the, the, the primary goal, uh, the primary uh, geostrategic geo goal of the United States, of the new conservatives in the United States. And th this is because uh, the rise of China threatens the Pacific, uh, whereas um, a China that is weakened uh, is not a threat to American power in the Pacific. So, uh, so that, uh, you know, um, basically that is uh, what he is most concerned about. Not so much as the freedom and, democ freedom and democracy of anyone. But to an Australian audience, he is kind enough to say that, of course, America will, pre will protect the freedom and democracy of the Australians. So here there is a level of realism that is, uh, that is revealed here. But at the same time, obviously, there is a, there is a, a level of, of hubris in this, uh, in this exact comment. Because uh, he must know, perhaps uh, subconsciously, uh, that if you, um, how to say, uh, if you if you if you talk this way in, in this manner to the Australians, um, of course, a lot of Australians would agree they would be welcome that that, that their um, their greatest ally. It's protecting them, it's shielding them from potential harm uh, by an Asiatic uh, country. But at the same time, they must know, perhaps not aware, but subconsciously they should know that this is not really for their interest. It is for the interest of the new conservatives. And they are and the fact that they are willing to pursue a common destiny uh, basically means that they share this, this hubris, this Anglo-Saxon hubris of basically, it's, it's another version, let's say, of manifest destiny. And at the same time, of course, when uh, Professor John Mearsheimer talks up China as a great threat. He simultaneously wants to diminish Russia and India. He says basically that, uh, you know, India is, uh, a, India is a country that uh, poses no threat to any other, any country. Of course, this is meant for an Indian audience uh, who, of course, uh, whom they want to pull into their alliance system. And they, this is also uh, perhaps meant, to, uh, meant for the Russian audience because they really want to pull Russia away from China. But this is, of course, a, a simple trick. This is the realism part of, of uh, new conservatism. But the, uh, the 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 hubris part of of their system of their belief uh, it ca is in my judgment to be found in the fact that Indians, while well, even though India is not a rich country, even though Indians are not fulfilling 
uh, are not realizing their potential. Indians are not stupid. At least their leadership is not stupid. Or well, at least not as stupid as this professor, Professor Zhao Mieshheimer, would like to think. In other words, well, India wants to, pre to, to have a certain check on growing Chinese power. I'm absolutely certain of that. And I think it is absolutely in their interest to do so, which is why they have tried to create a warm, warm relationship with Washington. Right, they want to have this check on China, on growing Chinese influence. There is, I, I believe, the idea that there could be a Nixon moment or the Kissinger moment. I, I'm not sure what, what is, how is it called, Kissinger moment or Nixon moment. Um, the idea that, um, that the new conservatives will be able to ally with India to cause a, to perhaps a fall of the Chinese regime or administration, however you, you like to refer to it, is unrealistic. The Indians, well, the Chinese, under a, I believe, in the, at the time, purely ideological leadership, who, a leadership with little understanding of, uh, uh, really with poor, let's say, poor understanding of the world at the time, which was evident in the mistakes, in the successive mistakes that they made in the 50s and 60s um, in terms of uh, economic growth, completely squandering the, the resources, time, and uh, their international situation. They were able to, they would, they made the mistake of partnering up with America to destabilize the Soviet Union. Now, of course, the Chinese learned the lesson. They were astonished in the late 1980s and early 19, uh, 1990s when they saw the, 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 the precipitous fall, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And surely the Indians, having been a close ally of the Soviet Union, or maybe not ally because uh, India officially is part of the non-alliance movement, maybe not an ally, but cl very close friend of the Soviet Union, they know that if they did this with China, the next piece to fall will be them. Better that China acts as a check on American power. So that's, I think, uh, the, the idea that you can have a Nixon moment or Kissinger moment with, uh, with, uh, with India. Is unrealistic. And then, of course, there are also talks of a reverse Kissinger moment or reverse Nixon moment, uh, where, whereby America would partner up with Russia so as to destabilize China. This idea, of course, is also fanciful. Russians, they may have differences with, uh, with the Chinese, I'm sure they have um, at various levels, cultural, uh, historic, and uh, um, maybe just just values. There, there could be there could be differences, and of course, um, China being a big country next to them, there's always this, you know, uh, there could be this uh, this uh, cautiousness that is warranted, but Russians are not stupid. If they have this reverse 
Kissinger moment or reverse Nixon moment, and they cause a collapse in China. The next day, they will see Ukraine join the NATO. They will see Belarus having a color revolution. They will see uh, the, the, the Central Asian states join NATO and have color revolutions. And they will see continued attempts at uh, dividing Russia into several smaller countries. That's it's just absolutely going to happen. Uh, I think uh, someone, if the uh, the point with India is that okay, maybe India will be will be could, will be played and will be weaker. At least India, for the most part, is a is a coherent country. It has established a kind of national identity. With Russia, it has a very strong cultural and national identity, but it at the same time is sparsely populated. It knows that there are ways to, uh, to there are ways to divide the country. And uh, of course, it's part of the danger that, po uh, that, that Russia, potential danger that Russia fo fo faces is the presence of American military of American containment uh, in the former Warsaw Pact and former Euro uh, Soviet Union, S Soviet republics. So uh, it's a much graver concern, even for uh, compared to the Indian one. So absolutely, the, the, the idea that, that uh, the new conservatives have, that they will be able to uh, to have this so-called real politic moment to join Russia and India, that, that's fanciful. That is fanciful. Having said that, um, I think not every comment by Professor John Mearsheimer has been, uh, ha has been ridiculous or wrong. I, I do think if people share his world view, which is one of American dominance, which is one of American imperialism, absolutely not freedom and democracy, but the American imperialism, then he was right in that a, a containment policy against China should have, ha be, should have been implemented in the 1990s. It was not implemented in the 1990s, which helped, uh, which really helped the the growth of Chinese power, economic power, and the increasingly uh, geopolitical influence. I think he was absolutely right in this. But at the same time, he can't say that this is a problem, absolute problem, uh, because not all Americans subscribe to the new conservative doctrine. Not every American business subscribe, uh, subscribes to the American imperialist worldview. In other words, for them, it is better to make money from China and, of course, various other third world developing countries than it is to contain those countries and uh, make less money, right? So for most people, having a higher standard of living, making more money and increasing their quality of life is more important than imperialism. And this is uh, uh, something, of course, that need the new conservatives always like to gloss over. They don't want to justify why their choice, uh, their worldview is superior. Because in reality, they understand, this is, I, I believe, uh, they understand 
from a real politics or realistic uh, point of view, they understand that American imperialism serves the interest of the few, not the many. And this also is why they use the manipulative uh, ideas of values of freedom and democracy uh, as what well, as the, uh, the 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 main reasons for their for their actions in other words they are promoting democracy and freedom instead of expanding their geopolitical influence of their imperial uh, ambitions right so um, so there is that and of course one last thing one last point that I want to make is that part of this combination of realism and hubris make is perhaps uh, what leads to what, what can lead to the eventual downfall of uh, American imperialism the eventual downfall of new conservatism what I mean by this is that just again take the example of Professor John Mearsheimer. He and people who share his world views, who would like to, and I believe are, um, acting on a, um, a set of policies or foreign policies that can be summarized as the containment of China. Professor John Mearsheimer was, is, uh, really regrets that America did not start this policy earlier. And I think if America acted as a coherent imperialist power, they would have had. But America is not a, con it's not a coherent imperialist power. Beneath this American imperialism, it's still the democratic institutions that the founding fathers of that country invented or established and gradually built in about a century from the late 18th century to the middle to the mid 19th century. Uh, in other words, from the Declaration of Independence to the Civil War in that period. They built, the, uh, they built the, dem the democratic institutions, and that's institutions, those institutions are still, still there. And that means that um, this contradiction makes um, America, the American empire an inefficient empire. And, and uh, the professor's wish of containment of China was n ignored. It was, not, it was a really a fringe thought when he first promoted the idea, I think two decades ago. Now, I think the American government is actively pursuing this policy. And uh, I think w the irony is that had it in pursued this policy earlier, it might have had more success. And, but now, it, um, at this stage, pursuing this policy, combined with all the hubris and in incompetence, it, it leads me to believe that what can happen is a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is that American power can be overshadowed, at least in the Asia at least, uh, let's say in Asia, in Southeast, in South, uh, in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, America can be driven out of this uh, of this area because it has this manifest um, or declared, let's say, a declared intent to uh, to to have a conflict. What is called what what is uh, called by this professor as a uh, great power conflict. 
and uh, that is something that needed not be. If America had pursued a policy of common prosperity, let's say, let's call it like that, common prosperity, uh, basically, if America truly, truly promoted freedom and democracy across the globe, simply because, uh, simply being the leader in these ideals, America would have had a, a persistent position in global affairs. But because America was not really interested in promoting freedom and democracy, he would eventually see that its imperialist ambitions will be throttled by other countries who may or may not be free, may or may not be democratic, but certainly want their piece of the geopolitical influence. At least, let's say, they want their independent, sovereign foreign policy. And they want their own security. These are not things that the new conservatives are willing or are able to offer. And as a result, they will see that their imperialist um, influence wane over time. And uh, so it is because they think while they, and this finally, eventually, ultimately, is because while they think that they are being realistic, they think that they are using the idea of freedom and democracy um, as, uh, as a tool and they are being smart, right? they are deceiving the world. But in reality, they are being unrealistic and their hubris is their eventual downfall. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Have a great day.